Africa has the potential to leapfrog the world to move into clean energy. It also has the commodities to create this future. Will it be part of the fuel cell electric vehicles revolution happening in the automotive industry right now? Or will it be merely a spectator? Now, to open this up, I've got with me Dr. David Hart, uh, director of E4 Tech, who has consulted and carried out research on fuel cell and hydrogen issues for a wide range of organizations. Also, I've got John Butt, the CEO of Conduit Ventures, an independent fund manager that invests capital in high growth companies worldwide with technologies that address the critical issues in the power and energy. So just to start with you, Mr. Hart, um, if um, you just outline to the, to the viewers here, because there's a lot of confusion still about this, the difference between a full on electric car that you plug in overnight and this fuel cell. So they're both electric cars. Um, they're both completely clean, zero emissions, so you can, you can run them in urban areas. Uh, but the fuel cell does what it says. You, you take a fuel, you put it into the fuel cell, it turns it into electricity, so it's not stored within the fuel cell. And that means you can recharge very quickly, or in fact you refuel with hydrogen, three or four minutes. And you also get very good range, so 600, 700 kilometers is possible. So you have something which is equivalent to today's internal combustion engine. It's fully electric, it complements battery vehicles, it will have a small battery as well, but it's not a pure battery vehicle that you recharge with a plug. So, uh, Mr. Butt, I'll throw it over to you now. Um, what is the investment case for this? Uh, we were talking in the intro there about how this could be a leapfrog, it could be a giant leap for uh, the whole industry here. Um, what is the investment case right now for these kind of fuel cell cars? Well, first, I think I go along with what uh, Dave David said, that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's another form of vehicle electrification. And it's here and now, you can actually go out in some mar markets and buy a fuel cell car, such as the Toyota Mi Mirai or the uh, Hyundai Nex ne Nexo. Okay, so it's, at, it's there in the market. From an investment stand standpoint, you've got the supply chain because the fuel cell requires the uh, platinum, a, a, a catalyst, and the combination of several different components, particularly membranes and so forth, effectively form, call it intelligent chip, which goes into the fuel cell and enables that con conversion to, to a power. So if I may just uh, look at it from a South Africa pers perspective, multitudes of, of an investment case. And I'll just go back to you on, on the uh, technology front here. A lot of people, whenever this electric car story comes up, say like, when? I mean, even this morning I was uh, looking in the traffic, I could see all this smog rising from thousands of exhaust pipes. And I was thinking it can't be soon enough. But when do you think there'll be more electric and fuel cell cars than there are petrol cars? So what's happening now is we're seeing very, very strong pressure by consumers on politicians. They say air quality is appalling in cities. We are prepared to have different solutions if you will bring them in. So in London, Amsterdam, Paris, they're banning diesel buses. You have to have zero emissions. And you already have you know, a dozen buses, fuel cell buses running in London. You have thousands of fuel cell cars in California, maybe about 7,000. You have hundreds in Germany, you have thousands in Japan. So it's starting, it's a small start, but next year Hyundai will be putting about 15,000 into Korea. So it's really starting to ramp up now. And it's not just cars, it's buses, it's trucks, it's trains. There's a real enthusiasm behind this industry that we haven't seen for a while. I'll uh, say, uh, Mr. Pat, I mean, yes. something that we should all be uh, hoping for, yes. for the sake of the environment, but there's a lot of vested interests too. I mean, you've got uh, petrol companies, yes. oil producers on this continent, you've got uh, automobile manufacturers, the yes. whole industry that goes with it. Um, yes. How much resistance could you think they could yet be? I think I, would, I wouldn't like to look at it as a, there is a re resistance. Rather, people are coming together to form cons consortia towards this. So, I've not detected any resistance at, at all. Rather, they're, they're embracing it for all the reasons uh, we, we've outlined in the sense that uh, it represents an, an, a new mark market. The drivers are towards intelligent m and clean mobility. And so it is actually be being embraced by those in the infrastructure, the ecosystem, the OEMs, the uh, su supply chain. In actual fact, some of this 
supply chain guys are actually investing for the long term. They're taking positions. And uh, I can see in the not too distant future a big rush to grab that position in the supply chain. Well, there's a yes. case in point for you. I understand from here yes. you're going on to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, what yes. sort of uh, investors are you going to be looking for there? Who are you going to be talking to there? Well, we, we just came from uh, Cape, Cape Town at a conference uh, hosted by Nedbank CIB, CIB Research. And it was a very good com conversation there. And so we will, we will take the pulse of what's hap happening. Yes. Good. Interesting. So, um, again, um, talking about um, suppliers as well, um, how long do you think from your research is going to be to build a full-on industry? I mean, here we have whole cities building cars, well, petrol cars. Is it going to be a question of just um, swapping the engines or is it going to have to be rebuilt? Two or three things. So, so the supply chain, as John said, is, is starting to build already. So the conventional tier one suppliers into the automotive industry are interested. So, you know, for example, Mercedes here makes AutoCATs, which it exports globally. They could do that with components for fuel cells. And, and we, one of the presenters yesterday at this conference was a, a company called Isondo, a local company, which is looking actually to bring the best of South African skills, which mm -hmm. are being developed through government programs by DST, through things called Hydrogen South Africa, and put those into place here to build a supply chain using the best in class from other places. So uh, TKK is a, a Japanese ca catalyst supplier, but using the platinum from here, the know-how, and entering the supply chain that way. So it's happening right now, to be honest. If you want to position in it, you need to be looking at this year, next year. Otherwise, you're going to be probably too late. And uh, the question I think I have for both of you here, um, a lot of people in the platinum industry who've been plagued by low prices of not much over $900 uh, an ounce, but say, no, 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 fuel cell technology, that's what's going to rescue the price and the industry. How likely is that? I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm very, f I've been in the industry for 25 years, so I've been through a lot of ups and downs, and, and this feels completely different. This feels like a real growth phase. So I think it will be growing and it will require platinum. There's no question about that. There is an interesting question about pricing because of course price is too high, mm -hmm. makes the components too expensive. So there will be some balancing and 900, 1000, 1200, I think is entirely possible, but I'm not the supply demand expert on the platinum side, but I think there's, there's definitely gonna be a growth in demand. And um, what are you hearing from investors about this idea that it could be, um the salvation of the platinum uh, industry. It will definitely yeah. help. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that, yeah. uh, that for, sh for will sure. Will it replace catalytic converters though? I, mean, uh, I, I see it as complementary. You see, the, uh, those converters will always be, be there. It's uh, complementary. So we're looking at new demand. So it's, so it's growth. But as I said earlier, it's the, it's the supply chain. Because if you want the, um, the OEMs to ramp up, you need a credible supply chain and a secure s supply chain. And this investment thing, I mean, is it, is it like um, the original sort of IT companies that people were invested in 20 years ago? Is it something that people are missing out on, you think, yeah, investors? I, I think we are seeing money flowing into that space more and more now. And people are looking at, you know, which spots to play in. If I may just mention China, we spend a, a lot of time in China. And that's, that's a big drive towards um, multi multiple types of powertrain for vehicles, but more specifically in the last two to three years, a massive push towards the development and adoption of the fuel cell technology for mo mo mobility. This is um, passenger cars, medium duty, heavy du duty, right across the spectrum. And uh, what are you hearing over in China about the possibility of Chinese companies investing here? In I, the would, same I would not rule it out. I think that, I mean, the uh, Chinese companies, as, as you know, they're st strategic in their outlook. So it's possible. Yes. Well, just uh, back to you, David. I mean, this technology, how close is it, you think, to being leapfrogged again? I mean, what's the next stage, you think, after this? There's not much next stage, to be mm. honest. I think that, you know, the car companies have spent an enormous amount of time and money looking at this. Zero emissions is the inevitable end game. Everybody believes that, e even the oil companies, mm -hmm. interestingly. <laughs> Um, and batteries will fulfill a role, but they don't do everything well. They don't do long range and heavy duty well, and fuel cells are the other thing. So electricity and hydrogen 
in fuel cells, there isn't actually anywhere to go after that, mm. really. But what I'm t talking about time here, I mean, a lot of banks in this country have stopped investing in coal-based projects because of the world um, emissions uh, regulations that are coming in. Yeah. But having said that, a country like this, which produces a lot of pollution from coal, <laughs> You're going to have coal for the next 10, 20, 30 years, probably. I mean, yeah. isn't it, couldn't it be the same with, with petrol cars? You, inevitably, it won't be an overnight switch, but that, that won't happen. But uh, what will happen is that there are very strong drivers to producing clean hydrogen, for example, even from coal. So the Chinese particularly have a huge amount of coal. They do want to reduce emissions. You can uh, capture carbon. You can reduce particulate emissions. You can do things better. So there is a transition period where it's not perfect, but, but you do make significant advances and you can use fuel cells running on hydrogen, even if it comes from a fossil source, and still improve the quality of life of the people around you. Well, thank you very much for your uh, time and insights, gentlemen. Uh, fuel cell cars uh, may be the future. That was uh, David Hart, a director at E4 Tech, and John Butt, the CEO of Conduit Ventures.